This morning we're going to be looking. Yeah. I know her story. <clears throat> Yeah. Somebody else can join her if you want to. If you're online, you can join her from your home. Yes. First Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. Then we'll look at verses 18 and 19. First Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. Verses 18, 19, we'll be reading from the King James Version. Verse 1 says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him, his 600 men, lifted up their voice and wept, and they wept until there was no power to weep anymore. And David's two wives were taken captive. Hyanom, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And here's our key verse. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself. In the Lord. Verse 7. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me thither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him. The Lord answered him, saying, Pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them and without fall, fail, recover all. Verses 17 through 19, David, excuse me, in verses 9 through 17, David pursues them. And then verse 18 and 19 concludes. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them. Neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. David recovered all. Again, our key verse, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Look at somebody and say, be encouraged, be encouraged. In, the in the Lord. Be encouraged, be encouraged. In, the Lord. in the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, you are good to us. We have celebrated you this morning. Me and every song reminded me of this text. Because of who you are and what you have done for us. We can be encouraged because we know you, God. There is no other way. Many of us have tried. And you blessed us to make our way back to you. So we say thank you. Bless now this teaching of your word that in all things I may decrease and you increase. The people need to hear your word speak to their issue today, God. And so we pray that you will do just that. We thank you. We thank you. In your son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. As always, I do give reverence to God and honor to my bishop, leadership of the church, you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Be encouraged in the Lord.
They had been married 51 years. They did everything together. They went to Sears together. When she was shopping, he'd be sitting in one of those chairs near the appliances just waiting for her to come out. They rode to the hospital where he, she worked at a hospital, he worked at a meal, and they rode together every single day. They did everything together. She never had to drive. He took care of the family. He brought his check home every week, and they raised 14 children. She loved him dearly. They did everything. And suddenly, he passed. Suddenly. And she was devastated. She was wounded. And she had to be hospitalized herself because she grieved so. But slowly, 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 she came out of that thing. And she began to see her life in a new way. Sometimes life deals some hard blows. And I came to this, this is a phrase I heard not too long ago that describes this perfectly. Life be life in. <laughs> Say that with me. Life be life in. It might not be proper English, but it describes exactly what's going on. Sometimes things happen to us that just cuts to the core. David is modeling for us today that kind of moment. Chapter 27, David and 600 of his men flee from Saul. Saul is trying to kill David. He has 600 men. Saul now has a, and brother Paul has a, rep, excuse me, I'm lost here already. David has a reputation. Saul has killed his thousands David is 10,000. He has ascended to a place of popularity, and he now has a mortal enemy in Saul. So Saul seeks to kill him, and he flees to a country called Gath. He swears allegiance to the king of Gath because he can't go back home again. And what Gath, in doing this, he finally says, give me and my men a place to stay. And so the king, King Ashish, sends him to Ziklag. And he stays there for a year and four months. Chapter 29, the Philistines, where Gath is, decide they want to attack Israel. And they begin to marshal their troops. Now David, who is allied with them, says, I'll go with you. And so he lines up to go fight his own people. But the general said to the king, we don't need this brother with us. <laughs> That's his people. He will get there and turn on us. So the king reluctantly said to David, I trust you, but they don't. I need you to go back home. That brings us to the first verse. They travel for three days. And when they get home, they find their city destroyed. Everything is burned up. All the property is gone, but more importantly, their wives are gone, their sons are gone, their daughters are gone. Everything they valued in life has been taken. And they are angry and they are sad. You ever been sad? I mean, you ever been hurt? Well, something just took you out like a, like a blow to your gut. That's what they were feeling. They were hurt. And in your hurt, what you sometimes do, you start looking for an enemy. David is hurting too. His wives are gone. His children are gone. But all of the men turn to him and say, this is all on you, bro. You, if you hadn't dragged us away, any excuse would have done. If you hadn't dragged us away, we would have been here to defend our families. But because we followed you, all that we love is gone. And he was hurting too. Sometimes when you're hurting and folks are attacking you, <laughs> He was hurting too. He was hurting too, but he did something. He did something amazing. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself 
in the Lord. David is going to teach us today how you get through those times. And many of you have already had the experience. I just want to share with you from his perspective that there are some steps you can take to get you through. Can we look? Can we look at David? Can we look? 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 David encouraged himself. Your faith encourages you. And so one of the first things David did, I believe, and that I'm going to tell you to do, is you need to stop and think about who you are in him. Say in him. Not, not who you are with your degrees, not who you are with who you know, not who you are in your fraternity, not who you are in the Chamber of Commerce, not who you are in the Fortune 500, but who you are in him. And so I want to invite you to do something. I want to invite you to do something. The teaching me requires you to be participants in this. I want you to say your name out. I am Charles Pearson. Now you say who you are. That's right. Say it again. Let's make sure everybody around you know who you are. Say it again. So, so, so here's what you got to do. Here's what you got to do. When you talk about encouraging yourself, the first thing you got to do is talk about who you are in him. In him. So tell somebody, I am created by God. I'm loved by God. I'm preserved by God. I'm his workmanship. I'm made in his image. I'm made in his likeness. I'm God's child. I'm God's child. I'm God's elect. I'm a joint heir with Christ. You got to know who you are. You got to say it. You got to say it like nobody knows but you. You got to say it. I know who I am. So look at your neighbor and say, I know who I am. But after you know who you are, now you got to deal with whose you are. Whose you are. Let's repeat again. I belong to God. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. He's a protector. He sustains me. He's the Lord of my life. He's the creator God. The God of grace. The God of mercy. Sovereign God. A God who loves me. Who died for me. Who rose for me. Who keeps me. That's who you are. Who you are, whose you are. Who you are, now tell somebody, I know whose I am. Don't let your circumstances define you. Don't let other folks talking to you define you. Know who you are in him. Know whose you are. You don't serve some God, a God. You serve the true and living God. That defies denomination. It defies tradition. It defies circumstance. God is God. Here's the truth. He's God whether you believe in him or not. Those of you online, don't let us have that only experience. You need to be saying it as well. Who you are. Whose you are. So those steps are critical. I think David went through that. I think he had to pause for a minute and think about who he was and whose he was. And then verse 7 brings me to my third point. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. The ephod was an apron that the high priest put on when he prayed. David getting ready to get real. <laughs> When life gets real, <laughs> your prayer better get real. You're not praying like to, with one eye open to see who's looking. No, it's you and the Lord. Have you been in a moment like that? Where you had to pray, get real, pr a warrior prayer. That's why I love that song, Bishop, This Means War. Sometimes stuff be happening to you and you quit playing. You quit playing. 
You attacking my family? You attacking my wife? You attacking me? You quit playing. It's like, I don't get to quit. I don't get to run. I'm in it to win it. Why would I follow God who won't keep me? Why would I follow God who won't comfort me? Why would I follow God who won't strengthen me? I've been there. I've been there. I know what he'll do. You pray because, and I've learned to say this, brothers and sisters, you don't just have a testimony. You are a testimony. When I walk in the room, I'm a testimony. Just getting there, David. Just getting there, Deacon Shannon. I'm a testimony. David was a testimony. David was a testimony. Reason David could go up against Goliath is because God had brought him through fighting a fighting lion and a bear. So when he started talking to David, Goliath, he's like, come on, bro. I ain't scared of you. I got your number. Come on. In fact, if you look at the text, he ran to Goliath. He went to the fight. So when you know who you are and whose you are, then you can get real. Verse point three. How do you respond? How do you position yourself to be encouraged in him? You pray. You pray. You pray. And notice, 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 notice what, what David did. David didn't pray any old... Um, lackluster general prayer. <laughs> he, he said, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And God answered him and said, pursue for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. It's a conversation. You pray. You got relationship. You don't have a tradition. You got a relationship. You're not saved because of the Ten Commandments. You're saved because of what Jesus Christ did. You have a relationship. And with relationship, you talk to people you got relationship with. So he talked to him and he said specifically, what do you need to talk to him about today specifically? What do you need to talk to? What do you need to lay on the altar specifically? I specifically pray for my grandchildren. I specifically pray that they be safe in the streets. I specifically pray that no predator attacks my granddaughters. I specifically pray that they are protected. I specifically pray for their families. I specifically pray for my sons and my daughters' marriages. I pray specifically. Ask specifically. Pray specifically. Meditate on it. After you pray, listen. Listen, Brother Speed. Listen. Listen. And when he begins to speak, obey. It was in David's heart to go after them, but David still said, Lord... Lord, you got to pursue God. Lord, what should I do? Verses 9 through 17, David and the 600 men leave, going after this enemy with the assurance of God. Brothers and sisters, when God does assure you, you still got to do something. You still got to get up. You still got to prepare. Sometimes you don't have to fight. Sometimes you do. Either way, you're in his will. They go after them. And they encounter a man in the wilderness who was a, a former slave of the enemy, the Amalekites. He was an Egyptian. He was left behind because the Amalekites said he was sick and weak. But when they got to him, they asked him who he was. And then David said to him, can you show us where they are? The guy said, yes, look at God providing. You got to see God operating after your prayer. 
they follow and find them laid out on the hills because life was good. They had all the plunder. They had all the women. They had all the sons. They had all the daughters. And David and his men, now only 400 men, not even 600, fought them for three days and won. That's right. God will allow you to restore what's been taken. And sometimes he replaces with something greater. But what, it, what my point is, is that God got you. You got to know that. That's encouraging. If I know he's got me, if I know no matter what's going on, I'm his. If I have victory assured, then I can go forward with some power, with some clarity. I can go forward with some arrogance. He got it all back. But it began with him encouraging himself in him. Don't leave that last part out. There are a lot of books that talk to us about self-talk and positive thinking. Nothing wrong with that except for the fact that you ain't got no power. I'm not saying you can't do some things. I'm, not, I'm saying, and it was said earlier, we, in him we live, we move, and have our very being. If you think you woke yourself up this morning, no. I don't care how loud you set your clock. You didn't wake yourself up. In fact, I would challenge you, you don't even know when you fell asleep last night. It was all him. It's all him. Tell somebody it's all him. It's all him. That's why you can say I can do what? All things. Through who? <laughs> Nothing lacking. Nothing lacking. Nothing lacking. Nothing lacking. But before he could get that far, he had to encourage himself. Brothers and sisters, life be life Every day. Every day. <laughs> Every day. Some of these scripts you don't write. You don't write your child being sick. You don't write a script about losing your spouse, losing your sister. You don't write a script about getting laid off. You don't write a script about being behind, behind in your mortgage. You don't write a script about your company having to go in bankruptcy. You don't write a script about that. That's life happening and Satan attacking. But every now and then, even God will allow some things to happen to equip you and build you up for next levels. But in the meantime, encourage yourself. So, so, so we, 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 we covered several points. One is know who you are. What's the second one? Say it again, say it again. And then the third thing you had to do was what? Pray. Say it again. Power. Specifically. Specific prayer. So, uh, last set of scriptures I want to give you. This to me is a statement of conviction. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. It may be on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you. Because when you're going through all these things, you got at some point, you got to make some statements. You got to speak. Again, always speak in word. Yeah, you pray, but speak word. If I didn't cover that point earlier, speak word. Say no weapon formed against me can prosper. Say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say the Lord told me he never leave me or forsake me. You got to speak some words. You know my favorite, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor powers nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall ever be able to separate me from the love of God. You got to speak that stuff to yourself. And now I'm going to share with you a statement of conviction. Paul wrote this in the middle of some struggle. I declare, I, de I, I challenge you to claim this same thing. Verse 8 says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body 
the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, we are experiencing him and his power. And we go through all this that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. In other words, the world sees Jesus in our walk. The world sees Jesus in our talk. The world sees Jesus as it watches you deal with being laid off. The world sees Jesus as it watches you dealing with being discriminated against. The world sees Jesus as it watches you endure your grief. Yes, you have it, but you're not in it alone. Remember the story, story I told you at the beginning of this about that woman? She came home. She taught herself to drive. Got a license. I think she was probably in maybe 80 by then. Got a license. Started driving out to Northwest Plaza to take a walk every morning because it was safe. Changed the eating habits. We go over there and there'll be all healthy food in the refrigerator. And then one day she got in her car, got on 70 and came to our house. I know this story because this was my mother-in-law. Many may blame. Didn't make this story up. When you know who you are, who you are, you got a relationship and you can pray. God will be present in a major way in your life. But maybe you don't know him. Maybe you don't know him. The word records this, that God created man. And then man sinned. They had a relationship. They walked in the cool of the day every day. And then man sinned. And when man sinned, it broke the relationship and they were kicked out into a fallen world. And they needed redeeming, but they couldn't do it for themselves. So Jesus, God became a man and became Jesus Christ and came down to this earth. He lived 33 years. And in the last three years, he began to preach the gospel. He declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming to the Father by me. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He, he, he opened the eyes of the blinded and the ears of the deaf. He did all of those things as signs of who he was. And he went to a cross and died. And then on the third day, he got up and declared all power. All power in heaven and earth. So when we accept him, as Paul wrote, as our Savior, then we can too declare all power in him. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead resides in you and I when we accept him as our Savior. If you're here today and don't know him, you don't know him, we invite you today, come to have this conversation. But more than that, hear his voice speaking to you. If you don't know him, you're not here by accident today. You're here because you need to hear an appeal, but he is calling on you.